so much. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr. Crystal Collier, and I do have some um, uh, education and information to give you, but the first thing that I want to do is share with you what really qualifies me to be here with you today. Yes, these are pictures of me when I was growing up. Oh, come on. You're supposed to go, oh. There we go. Okay. So that first picture, you know what therapists say? Think about your inner child. That's the picture I think of. I was five years old. Life was really wonderful. My parents stopped at the side of the road and took a picture when the spring flowers were blooming. Sorry, the stem content. Yes. Uh -oh. This was in the, the um, up to seventh standard, you can go to the uh, class. Sixth, sixth, sixth. Up to sixth. Seventh also again. Seventh also program 
and I started studying everything that I could get my hands on about the brain because I could not understand why this great, cute, smart kid made such terrible decisions. It really baffled me. So I started studying everything I could. I got a bachelor's degree, I got a master's degree, and then I went on later on to get a, a PhD. I'm a therapist, researcher. I wrote a book about all of this. And what I want to share with you guys today in this short period of time is what I learned to arm you in making decisions that will protect your brain or your child's brain. Now, as a clinician, I usually get asked this question quite a lot. Is it really that bad? Sometimes parents will come into my office with their child who is in trouble at school. And they'll say, I don't understand. I drank alcohol a little bit when I was in high school. I'm fine. I used some drugs in college. I'm okay. Is it really that harmful? Here is how I answer that question. 90% of adults who get diagnosed with a substance use disorder began engaging in their high-risk behavior when they were a teenager. This was really interesting to me, so I looked into it, and I found study after study after study that had graphs like this. What you see is that the younger you are when you start using a substance, the greater your risk of growing up and getting diagnosed with a substance use disorder. But if you look at this chart, if you just delay all the way till you're 21 years old, just wait to try alcohol or anything else that might be legal in your state, you almost completely eliminate your risk. This was interesting to me because I thought, wait, hold on, why is it just delaying that protects you. And then I saw these studies that showed almost every major mental health diagnosis has an onset of either in elementary, middle, or high school. What is going on during these teenage years that makes us vulnerable and fragile to substance use or mental health problems? It has everything to do with brain development. <laughs> and so I started studying how the brain grows and develops, and here is what I learned. It grows in two phases. The first phase is from birth to about age 11, 12, around puberty, when we grow about 200 billion neurons or brain cells. It's almost like God gives you a big chunk of clay you get all of these neurons. Most of them you're not going to use. And then when puberty hits, around age 11, 12 in that area, you shift into the second phase of brain development. And that phase does not complete until around the age of 24, 25, 26, when we have 100 billion neurons left over. This was baffling to me. I thought, why on earth do you lose 50% of your cells. And what I learned is that it has everything to do with connections. Your brain needs room for connections to grow. So let me show you what that looks like. This is an infant neuron, a little tiny baby neuron that's blown up so that we can see it magnified. And what you'll notice is that it's got a cell body, this long axon, what looks like branches or roots that reach out from it. Those are called dendrites. Dendrites are my absolute favorite brain structure because dendrites are literally the hardware of learning. Every time you learn something new or you practice something, you grow new dendrites that reach out to other cells, making long strings of connections for those skills in your brain. This last slide is age two. You can see the skills that this little baby is learning in the brain as those connectors are growing and making long networks, strings of neurons for those skills. And then of course, as you grow older, 
it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And of course, it's not long strings of neurons, it's networks of neurons that squish together inside of your skull, which is what makes those funky wrinkles in your brain. The more wrinkles, the more neuronal connections that you have. This is what we want to see happening in our brain. And here's what it looks like from the outside in. This is a beautiful study that was published in 1999. In order to get into this study, you could not have had any substance use history or mental health problems. You had to have a, a, the healthiest brain possible, and they looked at kids as they were growing through time to see how does the brain grow. And before this study was published, many people thought that the brain grew pretty uniformly all over, but this and many functional MRI studies afterward helped us understand that really the part of the brain that is doing all that thickening and connecting is right here behind your forehead and about halfway up the skull. Does anybody know what part of the brain that is? Right there, right behind your forehead. There you go. I heard someone say it. The frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, or the frontal lobe. You guys can see at about age five to around age eight, we have a frontal lobe, our adult brain, but it's immature, underdeveloped, which is okay because we rely on our parents and teachers' frontal lobes for guidance. When we get to about the age of 11, 12, that's when that switch, phase two of brain development, kicks in. And what you see is about 11, 12 years old, you have 10 to 15% of what will be your adult brain. And then we get to age 16, and you guys can see, about 45% of your adult brain is coming online. And what do we give you a license to do? Drive with half a brain. Yeah, that is a joke, you guys can laugh. But you also know that your insurance rates are really high for your teenagers, right? This is why. What was most astounding to me, though, was age 20. At age 20, 80% of your adult brain is online. I don't know about you guys, but I thought I was grown at 16. And when I realized, oh my gosh, you have five, uh, a whole fifth of brain development between age 20 and 25 to go before your fully formed frontal lobe peaks with connections at about age 25. Now, you grow dendrites for the rest of your life, but you grow them much more slowly. As you guys know, it's harder to learn the older that you get. Now, the brain has a rule that it figures out which cells do you burn away, which cells do you keep, and that rule is the use it or lose it rule which basically says the cells that you're using are the ones that get left behind, the ones you don't literally get pruned away to make room for more connections. So when I was a little girl, I loved reading and writing. My mother, when she was single, she would take me to her university's library, kind of wink at the librarian to watch me while she was in class, and I would sit there and read and read and read and read write book reports in the summer. So I developed long strings of neurons, and which is probably why I wrote a 400-page book. <laughs> but I hated math. If there are any math teachers in here, please forgive me. But I just did not like math. And so I have really short strings of neurons for calculating math. If you ask me to calculate a tip at a restaurant, I have to sneak out my calculator app to do that math. So use it or lose it is critical, especially when we think about what the frontal lobe does. The frontal lobe, it has a nickname. It's the CEO of your brain and your body. There are some beautiful studies out there of young moms in an fMRI who are shown pictures of people, and then when pictures of their children flash on the screen, their frontal lobe lights up. This is where we connect, where we have a lot of mirror neurons. There are some beautiful studies of devoutly religious people in an fMRI who are asked to pray. As soon as they start praying, their frontal 
frontal lobe lights up. This is the part of the brain where we connect to other people and to our higher power. Incredibly important part of the brain because it is also where executive functioning skills reside. And they grow according to those two phases. On the left, the lower level executive functioning skills that come online from birth all the way up to around elementary middle school. Of course, we still continue to grow those skills our lifetime, but they really come online then, which is important because this is the time of the life when we need to wake up in the morning, get organized, out the door, get to school on time, remembering our homework. And then that second phase of brain development kicks in around the age of 11, 12, when those higher level executive functioning skills come online. These are the ones, scientists call them higher level, because these are the ones that you need to get up and out of your parents' house, being a fully self-supporting adult with good relationship skills. Can anybody guess which one of those executive functioning skills is the number one predictor of adult success? Self-control or impulse control. What we know is that if you don't have a lot of impulse control, you probably won't do very well in life. But for me, one of the most important skills is this one at the bottom, the ability to feel empathy. But what I've learned about the brain is that you actually need this skill, abstract conceptual understanding, in order to really feel empathy. You need higher level thinking ability to imagine what it's like to step inside someone else's shoes and think about what it could be like, what they're thinking and feeling if you've never been through what they're feeling. This is an incredibly important part of the brain to grow. And for parents, it's important to remember the use it or lose it rule. Because if you do all of your child's problem solving for them, they're not gonna have long strings of neurons for problem solving. They're gonna have long strings of neurons for dependency on you. Use it or lose it is critical. And here's what I learned about how alcohol, drugs, and other high-risk behaviors affect this part of the brain while it's growing and developing. In order to answer that question, we have to talk about this other wonderful part of the brain located deep inside those lobes called the limbic system. The picture on the right is my favorite picture of it. It's this 3D image of all the little teeny tiny organelles that make up your fight or flight brain. Estimated to be over a million years old, this part of the brain has been really honed to keep you alive and safe, but many people don't realize it's also where all pleasurable experiences begin and end. And when we think about pleasure, we have to know that it has everything to do with this neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that signals reward. You have other chemicals that your brain makes, like serotonin, norepinephrine. Those might help you stay stable in your mood. They may help your muscles get up and running, but dopamine is the neurotransmitter that tells you when you're doing something good for your survival. So think about what it feels like to have missed breakfast and lunch. How do you start to feel at about five, six o'clock when you haven't had anything to eat all day? I'm super tired, hangry, anybody get hangry? Yeah. So what happens is that when your limbic system starts to get hungry, it gets depleted of dopamine. Your limbic system says, hey, you need to go do something good for my survival, and until you do, I'm gonna make you feel pretty miserable. It depletes the amount of dopamine in your system. And then as soon as you eat, you get a 100% increase in dopamine. Your brain just said, hey, good job, keep me be alive, we'll do it again in the next four or five hours. Here's your reward, feel calm and happy. There's another human behavior when we engage in when we're married and it's protected, right? Good. Sexual behavior, friendship behavior, smiling. All of these connected behaviors 
increase dopamine levels by about 150%. Scientists say that the reason it's more is because not only are those things good for your survival, but they're good for your species' survival. Normal, natural, healthy things that we do that keep us alive, connected to each other. But if somebody engages in substance use, if somebody uses cocaine, a very powerful stimulant, their brain gets a 350% increase in dopamine. Now your limbic system is not the thinker. What part of the brain is the thinker? Right there, exactly. Your limbic system is really good at math. And all it does is it says, wow, when you put that in my body, I get 250% more dopamine than when you put that in my body. So that must be 250% better for my survival than that. Is that true? No. But your limbic system gets tricked into thinking it is. There are other more powerful substances out there like methamphetamine. If you use a line of methamphetamine, your brain will give you an 1100% increase. It's scary. Heroin is 1300%. When I read the study about heroin, I went to go put the bar in this graph. And then you couldn't see food or sex anymore. And I thought, you know, that's what happens. If you've known someone who became addicted to opioids or heroin, what is one of the first things they stop doing? Eating. Having healthy relationships with the people who love them because their limbic system is getting hijacked by that drug who says, I am this much better for your survival than those people or that thing, which is not true. So let me show you what happens. When we go above our threshold, your brain can store about 200% an amount of dopamine at any given time. So when you get a signal, your brain can increase dopamine levels by about 200%. And so your brain goes up and down with dopamine all day long. When you don't eat, it plummets. Then you eat, it goes back up. When you get bored, when you get lonely, you come here to community and it goes back up. This is just your normal feedback loop. But when you go above that line, that threshold that they call the hedonic or pleasure threshold, Two structural things happen in the brain. If we travel deep inside the limbic system and take a look at those neurotransmitters, those cells that are increasing dopamine, if somebody increases dopamine too much, dopamine comes across the synapse, binds to those receptor sites, the impulse goes down the cell, releases more dopamine, and so on and so on. But if you are engaging in something that depletes those cells of dopamine, you don't produce the same amount for days, maybe even weeks after. Now, the good news is our body can heal from that. If somebody goes drinking, they end up having a hangover, they feel pretty yucky for two or three days, the brain replenishes the amount of dopamine, and they keep going. Things like meth or heroin, can damage that process. It can take months, even years, for your body to replenish its natural stores. But the structural change that I am most worried and concerned about is this one. When you flood the synapses with so much dopamine, those long dendrites that have those neurotransmitters on them, gets a signal that says, ah, there's so much dopamine, I better grow more receptor sites. So it grows more structure to handle the influx of all that dopamine coming in. More and more dopamine in your synapses literally means more brain structure. And you can't unmake brain structure once you make it. That is unfortunately why we have the same once an addict, always an addict. Once you create this new brain structure, you can't uncreate it. And now, when you have too many receptor sites, 
your brain says, wait, where is all that dopamine once the dopamine leaves your system? And that is when we go into withdrawal. This video can show you the process of a tolerance being created. You use a little bit more than you should and it creates new receptor sites. Now next time you have to use a little bit more because you have more brain structure that starts craving it more. And then so on and so on until one day you walk over that invisible line and you have one too many receptor sites that are screaming out for dopamine. And that is when we move into addiction from misuse or abuse. These new brain structures have another effect on the brain, especially if you have a genetic predisposition. You may have a genetic predisposition that tells your brain to make a little bit less dopamine. It's a condition called reward deficiency syndrome. And if your brain and body, your cells, don't make the same amount of dopamine that other people do, your threshold will be lower. And so I have a story that really illustrates this point. I had a young lady come to me at my office. She was in trouble from her high school. She was a freshman. And she walked in the door and said, oh my god, Dr. Collier, you're the brain lady. You came to my middle school a couple of years ago. Did a great presentation. I stopped smoking marijuana for about 30 days, about a month. I know, right? I said, okay, great, but then what happened? She said, well, I was going to high school, and I thought everybody was doing it. But my best friend said, I'm going to be your accountability buddy. So her and I would go to parties, and if she drank this much, I would drink this much. If she took one pill, I would take one pill. If she smoked one hit, I would smoke one hit. So I'm scratching my head thinking, accountability buddy? I'm not sure about that. And then she proceeds to tell me, oh, that didn't work out so well. I mean, I'm in trouble. I have to see you. I said, how about your best friend? She's like, you know what? She really didn't like the taste of it. So we would go to a party, and she would have a red Solo cup with soda in it. And it would make me so angry, so I'd sneak some behind her back, and then I always drank too much. As a matter of fact, she won't speak to me anymore. My first question for this beautiful young lady is, do you have any of the genes for addiction in your family background? And she was like, yeah. That's why my grandparents have custody of me. Both my parents have addiction, and they've been gone for years. But her best friend has no genetic predisposition. So her best friend has a hedonic threshold that would be indicated by back that black line. But this client of mine, her hedonic threshold is lower because she has the genes that tell her body not to make as much dopamine. And I want you to know, in every culture of the world, there is between 12 and 25% of the population that carries some or all of those genes. I am one of them. I got the genetics from both sides of my family, and my genetic risk is very high. Out of 2,200 genes out of 30,000 genes, I've got about 1,000 of those that predict my brain will make less dopamine. So I seek it out in different places, just like I did when I was a kid. But here's the scariest part. As a researcher and a therapist who works with kids is what it does to the frontal lobe. This is a functional MRI looking from the top down. And what you see is a brain that's three seconds apart. A picture has been taken of it. The one at the top is of somebody who has no alcohol or drugs in their system and is completely calm and feels safe. What you see is the colors indicate brain activity. The darker the color, the more activity. This is what we want to see in a healthy brain. All of the lobes all around the brain are on and working together. The bottom brain is someone who just ingested cocaine. And what you see is that the limbic system is lit up. The limbic system looks like it's in the back when you look from the top. It's lit up processing all of that dopamine, 
But look what happens to the prefrontal cortex. The frontal lobes shut off. Your brain thinks you're good. I mean, think about when you eat a really heavy meal. What do you feel like after? What do you, what do you want to do? Take a nap, right? Watch TV. Do you want to have deep, empathic conversations? Do you want to solve major problems and regulate your emotion? No, because you're in a food coma. Your frontal lobe shuts off while your limbic system is full of dopamine. The survival mechanism kicked in. Interestingly, this is also what happens to your brain when you're scared. When you're really scared for your life, your limbic system kicks in to mobilize you to fight, flight, or freeze. Shuts off your frontal lobe because you don't need to do higher level executive functioning skills. These are all normal brain functions that turn back on once the fear is gone or the intoxication is out of the system. But what if you're between the ages, really this says 11 here, but what if you're between the ages of birth and 25 and you're growing your frontal lobe? If because your frontal lobe is off due to intoxication, or living with fear. If it's off, does it get to grow? No. We call that, well back in my day they used to call it arrested development, and now today they call it hypofrontality. When the frontal lobe shuts off due to substances, what you see is that if somebody starts using here at about the age of 12, and they keep using pretty consistently, or they struggle with fear, depression, anxiety consistently. And they get help for their issues here at about the age of 20. And we took a picture of their frontal lobe. It would not look like that healthy 20-year-old frontal lobe. It would look more like that 16 or maybe even that 12-year-old, depending on how consistently, how frequently they used. Because the frontal lobe shuts off. Now here's the really scary part. If that 20 year old doesn't stop, what if they keep going and going and going past the age of 25? Once the frontal lobe is grown, that's the peak. So you want yours and your kid's frontal lobe growth to peak where it should and not much lower because that's what you've got to use for the rest of your life. I know you all know someone who may have done this in their youth. And now the way that they show up as an adult is maybe a little immature. They struggle with self-control. Those executive functioning skills, they don't have a lot of empathy. They're very hard to understand. Their decisions are poor. So it takes a long time to heal. These are pictures that show this process happening. The middle row is of a cocaine abuser who's 10 days sober. You can see their frontal lobe is still off. That limbic system is screaming for the thing it thinks it needs to survive. It's been hijacked into thinking that. And at 100 days clean and sober, you can see the brain is just starting to turn back on. It takes about 18 months for that person's brain to return to what normal looks like, 18 months. And if it's a higher, more addictive drug like methamphetamine or heroin, it can take up to four to five years. This helped me have empathy for people who are in recovery. Because if your brain looks like that for four years, oh my gosh, life on life's terms is gonna be tough. Tough to deal with. So, when I learned about this, I did a deep dive into a lot of things that turn the frontal lobe off, and that is why I wrote this particular parent guide. This is an alcohol study. Two 15-year-olds volunteered to take a memory test while in a functional MRI. One admitted that he'd been a heavy drinker. His father allowed him to drink alcohol. They drank a lot at home. When they asked his father, where else does he drink, the father said, oh, nowhere. He knows just to drink at home. But when you ask the teenager, what did the teenager say? He drank everywhere, exactly. In the memory test, you can see that our non-drinker has a lot more electrical activity, according to the color. But look at the more subtle difference. 
Look at those structural differences. Remember those long strings of neurons that squish down and make those funky wrinkles in your brain? You can see that happening for our non-drinker, but not for our heavy drinker. You can see diffuse arrested development as opposed to those nice, long strings of neurons that are forming for our non-drinker. Marijuana, in many respects, is so much worse than alcohol. Please hear me, I'm not advocating for that instead of the other. But the reason is because alcohol has a half-life of two to three days. Once it's out of your system, your frontal lobe can turn back on. But if you drink every Friday night, you might potentially lose up to two to three days of frontal lobe development per week. 12 days out of 30 of arrested development. But marijuana's half-life is one to two weeks if you just use once, up to three to four weeks if you use more than that. That means it stays in your system longer. Now this is a PET scan, or excuse me, a SPECT scan, looking from the bottom of the brain up through the skull. And if all your neurons are really well connected, you're gonna see a nice smooth scan. The two gentlemen who volunteered for this study admitted that they had a regular, consistent use of marijuana. And I assure you, they are not holes that you're seeing in their brain. There are areas that didn't grow yet. They just didn't develop. Especially, what is this part of the brain supposed to be? The frontal lobe. That is the area of least development. If you look at technology, the study was done in Japan. They looked at a group of students who only used technology for a few minutes, a couple hours a day. And if you connect all the red dots, you'd see their brain connectivity. They compared that to a group of high school students who dropped out of high school and spent 12 or more hours a day in the internet cafe. The purple lines showed their brain connectivity. Now, you'll notice that right here, looking from the top of the brain down, you see a big area of connectivity, dense connectivity. That means they're using that part of the brain the most. More connections are growing. This is our sensory and motor cortex. But when you look and see how many connections they have going into their prefrontal cortex, it's easier to see on the top one, you see one area of connectivity. Their brain is just not growing those connections because those are the skills they're not using. Use it or lose it. If these guys keep doing this behavior well past their 20s, what kind of an employee will they make? What, a, what kind of a parent will they turn out to be without those executive functioning skills? And if you look at pornography studies, a recent study came out a couple years ago that said a half hour viewing session of pornography is the same amount of dopamine spike as snorting a line of cocaine. And it shuts off the frontal lobe in the same way, but it also increases the size of the nucleus accumbens, which is what you see on that bottom row of pictures. That is the pleasure-seeking part of the brain, where all those extra dendrites and receptor sites are growing. If you take a look at video game use, you see some disturbing studies. This particular study was done with a group of young men who were asked not to play a video game, that's the control group, and a group of young men who played Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, which is a first person shooter game. Now what they did is they put these guys, please hear me, I love video games, not saying anything against them, but first-person shooter games have an interesting effect on the brain. What they did is they put these guys in a functional MRI machine and they gave them different scenarios and asked them to come up with an empathic response. Remember that empathy is a frontal lobe executive functioning skill. It really should be quite online by the time somebody's 19, 20, 21 years old, which were how old these guys were. And you can see at baseline, the frontal lobe has a lot of activity in it for both groups. But then what you see is the control group who doesn't play has a lot of activity in the frontal lobe continuously at week one and two, but our first person shooter game players 
not as much. And when you ask them, hey, what are you guys thinking when you do these studies? They say, I'm playing this first-person shooter game two hours a day. I can't have empathy. I'm shooting people. I have to shut that part of the brain off. Oh. If you think about our military, this is how we train our soldiers, to shut off empathy. But the scary part about executive functioning skills is the use it or lose it rule. If you don't use those skills, you don't grow long strings of neurons for them. And it's hard to do that later on in life. What if these guys kept playing and playing and playing past the age of 25? Maybe they started at 13, 14. What if they don't ever grow the kind of empathy that would make you a really good employee or a parent or a human? Mental health issues can do the same thing. God bless this person who volunteered to be in a study while she was having a panic attack. She was in a functional MRI machine so we could see what happens in the brain during anxiety. What we see is decreased activity in the frontal lobe area, and the red indicates a lot of activity. There's our limbic system, white hot looking from the top down, but you can see the frontal lobe has a lot less activity because this person is panicked. Their frontal lobe is off. Their limbic system is in fight, flight, freeze mode. Half of all anxiety disorders are diagnosed by age six. We see anxiety, that is natural human emotion. Anxiety just means you care about something. But when anxiety goes out of control and we don't have good anxiety management skills, we can shut off our frontal lobe. And if we do that too much while our frontal lobe is growing, it could also arrest development. Depression looks similar. The brain on the left is what a healthy brain should look like. Activity equally all over it. The one on the right is of an adult who has chronic depression and you can see that the frontal lobe is really, really, really inactive. But the good news, looking from the top down, is that getting help works. This study is of a person who had chronic depression you can see the baseline scan, really not a lot of activity. This person's had chronic depression for decades, but after eight weeks of medication and talk therapy, you can see the brain turns back on, especially there at the top where the frontal lobe is. Connecting, getting healthy, learning good conflict management skills, abstaining from substances keeps that part of the brain on and growing. And that is what prevention and treatment should look like. Long strings of neurons growing for our executive functioning skills. So as a parent, what I did is when I was researching the topics for my book, I wanted to make sure that I understood how to teach people brain-based praise. And so here's what that looks like memorizing these terms, but using them in your own hip, slick and cool language. Like you don't want to say to your 16 year old, nice task initiation son. <laughs> no. You want to say, thanks for doing that. I didn't even have to ask you. Nice. Oh, I like how you're problem solving. Tell me how you did that. Woo, you really calmed down today. A few months ago, mm -mm. what's happening in your brain? This is brain-based grace. I learned that when we use primarily intelligence-based phrase, like, you're so smart, that'll be no problem for you because you're so intelligent. When a child finally fails something, instead of attributing it to effort, they might attribute it to, well, maybe I'm not so smart. When we use performance-based phrase, nice job, good work, we do that all the time. If that's all we use, we might increase performance anxiety. And people's value and worth gets tied to how well they're performing. So I want you to use a little bit of both of those and a lot of brain-based traits. Memorize these terms. Figuring out which ones you're good at, which ones your partner is good at, your kids are good at. Praising them for that. And then creating a plan for the ones that you want to see increase and praising a lot for those. I have studied prevention science. There's been about 60 years of 
a wonderful science. And this is a short list of what you can do at home. You can get genetically tested to find out if you have RDS, Rare Deficiency Syndrome. If you want that information, please email me and I'll share it with you. But what we also want to do is do consistent education at home about redu reducing high-risk behavior. We want to make sure our kids are involved in lots of pro-social activities where dopamine comes naturally. We want to make sure that we eat together regularly. We want to create a family code of ethics. And when our kids or our family members engage, in substance use behavior, we want to make sure that we give them the right amount of consequences. Parents always ask me, but I want my child to come to me, so this is what we do. We say, in our family, we don't use drugs or alcohol, but if you choose to do something different, and you tell me, your consequence will be minimal. If I find out from someone else besides you, your consequence will double or triple. That'll keep them talking. And we also want to treat problems immediately and dispel the norm that everybody doesn't. I want you guys to hear about 75 to 86% of all high school students try drugs and alcohol in high school. That seems like a lot. Its access is there. Even great kids who have good morals and values Sometimes they get so curious and they don't have enough impulse control on their frontal lobe yet to say no. They are more likely to say no if you have a family code, if you've talked to them about it, and you teach them not everybody does it. As a matter of fact, most of those kids don't go on to continue. Only about anywhere between 25 and 30 percent of every high school population goes on to misuse. And about 12 and a half percent can get diagnosed with a substance use disorder by the time they're seniors. And it's those kids that are the loud, noisy minority. The majority of kids that don't use substances, which are the majority, are silent. And today we have social media that can really have a negative effect. They did this brain study. They showed this picture to kids, which depicts drinking and driving. They showed it with six likes. You can see not much is happening, especially in the frontal lobe. Back here in their occipital lobe, they're looking at the picture. And then when you increase the amount of likes to 87, you see a lot more activity, especially in the prefrontal cortex. And when you ask these kids, okay, now what are you thinking? Your brain is lighting up. They say, well, I'm really looking at this picture to try to figure out what's changed. I mean, if more people like it, Maybe it's not such a bad behavior after all. This is the power of social media. And this is where we can get the idea that everybody does it. If you've got five friends and five of them have tried drugs or alcohol, it may seem like everyone does. But as it was in my case, I was hanging out with the wrong five people. So in my book, I wrote a lot about parenting. I also wrote this in what I call infographic style with lots of fun pictures because I don't know about you guys, but I don't read as much anymore. And so I wanted to make sure that that was fun and the right information right when you need it. The first couple chapters are all the information that I just gave you all about the brain and how it develops. Then there's an elementary, middle, and high school chapter. And what I did is I tracked 18 different high-risk behaviors that the kids I see in my therapy practice have to struggle with today. We all are going to be faced with this as we grow up in a technologically advanced world. And I charted when they spike. So you know, oh, I better have that conversation here rather than later. It's the biggest mistake we do in caring for kids is we don't talk about it sooner. And so to help you build executive functioning brain-based parenting scripts, I put one of this for each skill in the book. And I highly recommend that every topic should not be taboo. Things like this are happening in our culture everywhere. 
When I learned when I was researching my book that 70% of the United States 13-year-olds are using pornography on a regular basis, it scared me because I've seen all the brain studies that show what it does to the brain. And so please, don't follow the dysfunctional family rule. Follow the functional family rule. Talk, trust, deal, feel. Make sure that you create a family code. This is the family code building activity that I put in the book. A family code is a very short code. In the Collier family, we treat others with kindness, compassion, and respect on and offline. We are upstanders. If we see somebody being bullied, we do not use drugs ever. And only alcohol when we're 21 or older, unless we have the genetics. Then what you do at your family dinner table is talk about that. This is our family code. What we know is that when families eat together more often, they know more about their children. They know more about each other. They get a chance to talk about the family code. What you see is that parents feel more connected and know more the more you eat together, which it gets harder as we grow up. I also put a conversation starter calendar that shows you all of the different prevention days. So when you're sitting around the dinner table and you're like, okay, you know, today is World No Tobacco Day. You guys know anybody at school who vapes? They can talk about that. And then you can say, well, in our family code, you don't use drugs. It saves you from having to lecture, which they don't listen to anyway, and you reiterate that. One or two times a month. That's all you need, but it needs to be consistent. What the research shows is that when you do that, it builds family unity. And as we grow into teenagers, we want to learn how to make our own decisions, but we still want to know what you think, what you would have us do when we go out into the world. And if that is memorized, perfect. I also put different tools in the book that you could use. Each talk has fun things to do, one page, so it's not a lecture. You can make it more fun. I wanted to make sure that kids have information from you about how to analyze messages from the media, what is a medicine, what is not, when they have a smartphone that you have a good contract that tells them how to use it with their frontal lobe, with driving to make sure they don't engage in risky behavior. Also, a log that gives you a script when your child is over at somebody else's house, which is unfortunately where a lot of high-risk behaviors happen at slumber parties. But please remember, slumber parties are really important to have. Sleepovers, letting kids go to other people's houses, but we have to get on the same page with our other parents. And having that conversation sometimes is difficult. If you are a clinician, if you work with kids, there are a lot of clinical tools in this book. One of the best things you can do, which sounds kind of funny, is randomly test kids. When they move into that second phase of brain development, I always say, at the 12-year-old birthday, that you give them all their birthday presents, and then you give them a cup with a red ribbon on it that says, Guess what? Your brain is about to go through the second phase of brain development, and I bought a case of drug tests. This should last me throughout your high school and college career. And I'm going to just randomly test you one or two times a year, and that's going to be your refusal skill. You're going to go out to a party or a sleepover or an event, and when, not if, but when someone offers you something, you're going to be able to say, man, my dad drug tests me. It's the number one refusal skill. When kids have the pressure, the social pressure to want to fit in, like I did, you want that family code to be ringing in their ear, and you want a refusal skill, a reason to say no. Let them throw you under the bus. And we also want to teach them, as they grow older, what normal drinking looks like. In our culture, what we see on TV is binge drinking. It's not normal. Your liver can handle one serving size per hour, no more than two to four, depending upon your body weight and height. That is there as well. 
You guys, I work with a local charity that put all the research in my book in video format that we offer at schools. If you're interested in having brain abouts at your school or in your community, please let me know. And if you would like my slides, I would be happy to share them with you. If you want the book, it is in English and in Spanish on Amazon, as well as Audible. But remember, it's a big book. So when I read it out loud, it took 14 hours. So you will listen to me talk for 14 hours, if you listen on Audible. Before I finish and leave you guys today, are there any questions from you? I know some of you are here with your parents and you don't want to ask a question. Yes. What is the conclusion? The conclusion yeah. of the presentation? Protect your frontal lobe from high-risk behavior so that it will grow and develop to its peak potential. And if you are a parent, be your child's frontal lobe until they grow one of their own. Yes. Oh, you're stretching. Any other questions? I will stay behind for a few minutes if anyone has a question that they want to ask in private. Thank you so much for letting me present to you guys today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Dr. Crystal, you share very important and uh, inspiring points here today. And I know we'll take this information very seriously. Um, so on behalf of St. Mary's County Catholic Church, I would like to extend our special thanks to you.